of the year and two to have pointers as to where we are going uh, one as a party two as the government but most important the direction of our president E.B. Mangagwa as he strives and works hard to deliver Envision 2030 and the prospect of middle income status by Zimbabwe an eventuality which is day by day beginning to be palpable. You can, almost, you can touch it. Uh, so the president has had a good year. Uh, the highlight, of course, being the election win in August, a resounding win against uh, Nelson Chamisa and the CCC, and an even honey sweet win by ZANU PF. Uh, to retain its status as the ruling party of Zimbabwe. This was the highlight of our president's political achievements during the year. Uh, subsequent to that, we had a very successful party conference in Gweru, which focused solely, if not mainly, on the economic prospects of Zimbabwe, which will be the main subject of my attention today because it reflects the adage that nothing succeeds like success. Nothing succeeds like success. And the story of President Nagagwa in terms of economic performance for Zimbabwe is a story of success on a scale and on a scope which Africa has never known. Uh, it's, an, it's said that uh, there are toxists in the Zimbabwean national body politic, toxists, and I met some of them during my sojourn at the ex CEO executive conference in Victoria last month. There are toxists, naysayers, doomsayers, who never want to see the reality of this economy, even if it, when it is hitting them like a bolt of lightning. They don't want to see it. And they continue to preach a negative message about how Zimbabwe is performing economically, trying to blindside the whole population into following willy-nilly their toxic message. The president is delivering palpable economic tangibles to the Zimbabwe people. Every other day, we are seeing the president cutting ribbons on projects of all hue and color. You know, I was remarking the other day that yeah, most probably his fingers are now having sores morning because the president is busy with the scissors cutting uh, ribbons on major, major economic projects, which are not only of national importance, which are not only of, of regional importance, but which are of global importance. And still people don't want to see that. Why? Because if a steel plant is built by the Chinese, it doesn't exist. Even when the company which is building it is the largest in the world. When six billionaires land in Zimbabwe to do lithium, the top billionaires of the whole world land in Zimbabwe, and they build, they start mines and start lithium carbonate plants to supply Volkswagen, Tesla, Toyota, Nissan, Ford, Citroen Peugeot, 
a PSA. When they build those plants to supply lithium carbon for the batteries of those major car producers of this world, people don't want to acknowledge it because it is being done by a Chinese company. So it doesn't exist. This is when the billionaires are exploiting, exploiting the fifth largest resource of rock lithium in the world, which is in Zimbabwe. We are the fifth in terms of resources. We bring companies, billionaire companies to do that. That's what the president has done. He has uh, looked at the resources of Zimbabwe and started identifying the most competent technological partners, the most competent productive companies in those fields and is bringing them to, to Zimbabwe because the resource of Zimbabwe is commensurate with the capacity of global scale companies. That's why they are here. But our toxists who are used to the post-colonial Rhodesian economy, they can't fathom the scope and scale of what the president is doing. It's sad about those people, but we in ZANU-PF and the people of Zimbabwe, we are seeing an economy which is pumping. Look at the vehicles on the, on the road. Look at the, 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 the service stations every, which are being built. Look at the construction which is being done in this country. Not on a scale which it, ever in the history of this country. Look at the hotels. They are all full of business people coming to Zimbabwe. Where it has gone around, that Zimbabwe is the, is the best place to be if you are an investor. Look at our president being lionized in Dubai. He is being lionized by top business people of the world. He goes to, Abu, to, to he gets invited by the country with the largest sovereign world fund in the world, Saudi Arabia. He gets invited to an Arab summit because the Saudis are seeing something about Zimbabwe which our toxins are not seeing. You know, uh, you know, if it was the Chinese, then they would say, well, they are traditional friends of ZANU PF. You know, but these are new players, new kids on the block in terms of uh, investment. They are all paying attention to what our president is doing in this country. And we have these toxists who are claiming to be pundits of investment when actually they are just downright ignoramuses who are blind to what is going on in the, on the, blo on the stage of Zimbabwe. We, we, we have even the, the British, they are eating out of Zimbabwe, the, the palms of Zimbabwe. They are excited about what they are doing. Their amb ambassador, Ambassador the Pete Vowles, he is coming here with a, with a bullish message about Zimbabwe and where it is going, even with the former colonial power. Now, this was the country which was the main source of bad news about Zimbabwe. They are bullish about Zimbabwe. Look at the frequency of meetings which we are now having with the British. People don't meet frequently unless there's something good which is going on. People who are quarreling, they don't. So the president has really been in London several times, and each time the British are getting a chance to meet Zimbabwe as president. They are seizing that chance. We had uh, Andrew Mitchell meeting again the president just a few days ago in Dubai. This is uh, a vote from the country which, formed, which sponsored the money for the formation of the opposition in Zimbabwe in 2000. What does it mean? They are moving to a new page about Zimbabwe, a new page, a bullish new page about London Harare relations. Now we have these people who are a product of a bygone era when the relations were not too good. They still spread, spread the message of toxic Zimbabwe, toxic Zimbabwe. It's in their imagination, it's an aberration. It's far from the reality of what this country is and there's that you know, fishing party, which was originally formed by that money, the triple C, it's gone. You know, hey, you know, they are at each other's throats. Everybody knows that the internecine fights which are going on there are the product of the Wapusa Wapusa philosophy, which then which triple C became after the departure of Sangrai. A whole party built on labor structures structures of the labor movement, which ZANU-PF set up after independence. There was no labor movement 
legal labor movement before independence. We set it up, we said to, to you, as a product of the Zimbabwe revolution. Two decades later, it is hijacked and it becomes a party for the subversion of the Zimbabwe revolution. But as a democratic state, we said, let it subsist. Then with the passage of time, the, the momentum which we had built peters out. And unfortunately, their leader also dies. Because naturally, people die. You know, you come and you go, you, go, you, you exist, and you, go, you die. Sangrai dies. Who takes over the party? It's a coup within the party. They've never held a Congress. They have no structures. They take part in having no structures. Yeah, and the people who are supporting them, they all come from countries with party structures. Their government, they are elected by party structures. But they still handhold this party which has no structures and expect it to do miracles in Zimbabwe. It's not possible that a structureless party can do miracles. And sooner rather, later, rather than later, the electorate sees that this party is a phantom organization. It is a, it, 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 it does not exist, and the electorate starts abandoning it. You are seeing it now in the elections which are happening at even in Mbari, urban area. If you want to know the bellwether of Zimbabwean politics, start with Mbari. That's where the nationalist movement started to be where we are. That's where the most uh, you know, ardent of uh, cadres, those who were most uh, you know, organized, came from to go to the war. Last election, Barry decided to abandon triple C. It's an urban trend. You know, it has happened now in urban. We are winning by elections in urban constituencies. The message is getting through that President Mnangagwa, by having the economic reforms which he has done and attracting capital, he is restoring vitality to the urban areas. There is a time lag between investment in mining and in agriculture, in which are in rural areas, takes, begins to have a national impact on the national economic scale. There's a time lag, a lead time, a gestation time. Now that gestation time is now beginning to catch up with the urban areas because the investments which are now going on in the rural areas are now beginning to have a spillover effect in urban areas. We are going to have many people get seven to five jobs. Because that's what urban people want, seven to five jobs. When you get steel plants, when you get uh, the battery manufacturing plants being, manufactured, being, being invested in, it means people can get seven to five jobs and they get a wage. And this is what is now reviving urban hopes. Uh, now, this is in sharp contrast to a party which for two decades has been in urban areas and never in one day has their leader been seen with a businessman. Businessmen come to Zimbabwe from foreign countries. They land at the airport. They never get any reception from a triple C town father. They have to go to rural areas, to mining areas to get investment. When their natural place of call from the airport should be Harare, because that's where the town is. A town is not a place for homes. That's why triple C, they all talk about the stands. That was stands. Every corner they are t t converting what were playgrounds to, you know, into, into, into stands. Uh, factories during their tenure were being turned into church houses because they think the town is a place of residence. It's not a place of residence. A town is a place of industrial activity. Factories. Residence supports factories. So if you don't have an industrial policy in an urban area, you have lost the game. And for two decades, towns have lost the game. You have never seen a, a, a triple C father, city father, or town father in the last 20 years with a businessman opening or uh, attracting investment to a factory. That's why the towns have decayed. They have rotted under the, the uh, now we are now having to use the central government to come in and, sub and provide services, which normally the ratepayer should be expecting from the city fathers. Look at Guadalajara. You've got big vegetable gardens of sewage vegetables because sewage is not flowing around. People 
harvest, they eat those vegetables because they are being watered by sewage, cholera all over the place. Why? Because the urban areas have no sewage. They have no water reticulation. They have no reliable electricity, even in the, area, in the era when electricity is supplied by light. If we had been a forward-looking city fathers, all the rooftops in urban areas would be covered by solar panels. <laughs> People would not need to be complaining about electricity from the central government. But there was no foresight at all with the city fathers that the urban trend today is uh, off-grid electricity. And what better place than Bazekuru Zeva and Zewuskwa? It's very difficult to put a solar panel. They in the normal towns, there's a Marat. If, if there had been any forward planning by the city fathers, by that party, which wanted to claim to be part of excellence. Why? Because they've got one fixation. Any power between where they are now is of no use until we get power at the state house. So all the, along the route, there are power centers. Local government authorities are power centers. That's why they are called local government, with statutes under the constitution, which support who they are. But because Chamisa had not yet gone to state house, he slips on the wheel, triple C, slips on the wheel of urban governance, completely slipping on the wheel of urban governance. Because Agamira Chinuchikuru, Chikuru State House, Mwezese Zirimu Roda, Zinabas. Now what is the result? Urban decay, now it is being revived by what ZANU-PF is doing because the amount investment in mining, in agriculture, is going to create resources which, will now, which are now attracting capital on a scale, big scale, which are now, so ZANU-PF will be at the airport very soon we will be at the airport with an in investment desk welcoming investors by their troops. Uh, and they will not be looking for townhouses. What is the normal thing for anybody is to arrive in a country and look for a townhouse, for the townhouse, for the mayor. Because investors are, go to a place to an address. They are not looking for the state, for the, for the government. They are looking for a place to do business. So the normal place of call would have been the townhouse. But nobody is there, completely nobody is there. So this is the contrast which I want this year where the, in, the picture is beginning to emerge of a forward-looking party and a visionary leader bringing deliverables to the Zimbabwean population, attracting global class capital to Zimbabwe, as opposed to a party which is constantly in a rare review uh, mood, a um, rare review mirror, uh, frame of mind. They never look at where the car is going in the windshield. They are always looking at the rare review mirror. How do we get to the state house? How do we, even when the elections are over, the elections are over in August. What we are doing is by election. No, we must convince the world that there must be an, a rerun of Zimbabwe election. Who has to be convinced we want to SADC to be organized? But we are free as a country since independence in 1980. We are sovereign. Nothing, SADC is a voluntary organization we belong to because we are independent. Now you want to give SADC colonial status over Zimbabwe to order Zimbabwe to have the elections. And SADC says, no, 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 Zimbabwe is a member country. We are on a peer to peer basis. We are happy with the elections, so we don't want. So Luanda says it's over, the elections are over. Triple C has been telling Zimbabwean electors that the elections are not over. So the whole country was supposed to be in a mark time about August. The clock stops in August. Uh, uh, until the, the, uh, now Sadak eventually announced that it, there's nothing like that. And the much touted EU report, nobody cares about that report because it was written at Harvest House. The countries moved on. The EU is not a sovereign, is not an imperial power on Zimbabwe. So a whole party was fixated on a stop, a clock which stopped in August because they were waiting that the elections, which are supposed to come in 2028, should now be compressed back again to this year. It does not happen. So these are the things which I want, we want to highlight, the contrast of the visionary leadership of President Nangagwa 
and his delivery, palpable delivery, as opposed to the dying people see party. Now they are at each other's throats, and it is not going to end there. It's not going to end well. You know, the courts refuse to entertain them because you got to go to court with a structure. <laughs> Who is complaining? Where is your constitution? Where are your structures? Uh, if you're an amorphous organization and you are before the courts, how does the judge make a judgment in favor of an amorphous organization which everybody acknowledges? Uh, you know? So the guy who was last elected is Chabang. <laughs> because, so the historical structure is one which the courts know. He wins this court case and surprise, surprise, Chamisa does not go to court to defend his party. Can you imagine it's a family and the siblings are quarreling. They go to the village chief. The village chief says, okay, you are quarreling. I want to know who is your father, who is your mother. And the father and the mother are not there. And the, children, the siblings are accusing each other. How will the judge de decide who is who? Because somebody must bow it for these siblings. Chamisa does not even bother to go to court. And you expect to win a court case. You know, the Wapusa Wapusa party. Now, in that party, there is a young girl, a youthful girl. We all respect youthful girls. More so when their father was a renowned educationist, Mr. Mahere. He's a renowned educationist, permanent secretary of education. In this fissuring and disintegrating party, Mahere wants to look like there is something which is there. It's no longer there, this party. And she continues to make statements as a chatterbox, left, right, and center. And most of the time, she's talking about things which she has got little grasp of. She reads, she can't grasp. She can't comprehend, she can't apprehend. She talks about the budget. She's a lawyer. I you wanted to be a lawyer in my life. Yeah. Later on, I became a finance man. Later on, I became a telecommunication specialist. You must respect knowledge about a, a certain discipline before you start talking <coughs> authoritatively about it. She makes lengthy statements about the budget of this country, saying it is anti-people, it is anti-this, it is anti-this. You read it, all, bo all boulder dash, no substance, because here is a, a flimsy legal mind trying to explain some of the deepest uh, concepts about finance, economics, and money, a, a subject which is well beyond your grasp. But because there is a vacuum in your party about you, uh, how to substantiate, substantively run things, she just thinks that your words can pass for knowledge. No, they can't pass for knowledge because they are not knowledgeable about what you are talking about. Your, your statements about the budget are a lot of bolder dash, a lot of nonsense. That budget, budget, budget is grounded on the economic performance of the Zimbabwean uh, people as they work. We are earning US dollars in Zimbabwe. We are not being given by the American government. All the hundred dollar notes which you see, they are all earned by Zimbabweans. They are not a gift from the, uh, from the Federal Reserve Bank of America. This is the basis on which the Minister of Finance and the Governor of Central Bank have presented the budget of Zimbabwe. And by the way, it is actually, an, it will turn out to be an interim, a, 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 a stop your budget, because the kick in effect of what's going on in our economy, because of the investments of risk, are going to create a positive big bang about the Zimbabwean economy. I just phoned today the, ministry, the, the, the Customs Bureau, Zim, Zimbra. I said, how much did we import to date in terms of steel. We imported 6.3 billion US dollars of steel. This is a big figure. This is to support the construction which is going on in Zimbabwe, 6.3 billion dollars. In two months time, I've made an offer, you know, which I still have to keep. We start producing steel on a scale which is bigger than what we are importing. So in that budget, 6.3 billion will turn up to be homegrown money from Manizia. 6.3 billion, and two, one third of that steel will be for export. So you add another one third to 6.3 billion of end money because we have saved 6.3 billion 
and we have added 1.3, at least 2 billion Zimbabwe dollars. Can you imagine what the impact of that on the economy of the country in the next budget? Because we are working on the historical performance of this economy, but the president has built, has created an economy much, much bigger than what people have been traditionally used to. And they listen to some uh, political commissar who also posits as a, an economist. His name is Gift Mugano. Always penning what the government is doing. He has never visited one lithium plant which is now producing 300, 400,000 tons of lithium carbonate. And there are five or six of them. Mugano has never been to any of them. He sits in his office, he looks at what he did when he landed at the University of Rhodesia in Zimbabwe a long time ago, and he is in a time warp. He is not seeing what the president is doing right now in terms of attracting world-class capital to invest in Zimbabwe's resources. Then he, put, he spouts you know, a lot of uh, silly figures about where this economy is going far removed from what it needs. Do you also realize the frequency of our meetings between Mozambique and Zimbabwe, between the two presidents? I told you yesterday, earlier on about the British. Now about Mozambique. Do you know the reason? Because Mozambique has fully prepared for a boom in exports from Zimbabwe. They've already built, rebuilt the railway line to, Man to, to Machipanda. Done by Mozambique. They are building two terminals in Baira to cater for the boom in exports from Zimbabwe. Mozambique has done it already. They are building it, they are planning a new port north of Baira. All of it based on the prospect of Zimbabwe coming, become, coming back as the hinterland of Mozambique, the economic hinterland of Mozambique. This is the reality of another neighboring country, which is reading the signs, the, 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 the litmus the, the paper, the, the, the litmus test of what is going on, and they are anticipating what Zimbabwe's impact will be on the logistics sector of Mozambique. And our neighbors in South Africa are coming in to fund new transmission lines. They are coming in to fund new railway lines. They are coming in to fund water pumps, water pipes. Yet I have got those people who are saying the country is toxic. How is it toxic to our, not toxic to neighbor, to Mozambique? <laughs> Why is it not toxic to South Africa, but it is toxic to you? So I want you, as the 40th state, to try to follow exactly what the president is doing. Look at the project which he is opening, which he is uh, launching as he goes and cuts ribbon. Look at the profiles of the investors in those companies. Who are they on the global stage? Uh, just don't write a story because that's that all when I'm gone. Look at who is the investor and why is he here. This is all information on Google. It does not require BT or, 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 or Nigel Chanakira or, or Trevor Nube to make you become enlightened. Uh, because if you get that, you get into the toxic uh, framework. Then you are, all, you, you, are, you are poisoned with their toxicity which is far removed from the reality of what the president is doing. So I, I encourage you, this is the magical effect of what the president is doing to the national economy. And this is what the achievement of the president in the course of 2023. And he's going to build upon that in 2024. So as we go for Christmas and for the end of the year holidays, we must go there on a bullish mood because the president is doing well. Look at the power sector in one year. Two major power stations have been built, uh, you know, and they are pumping 600 megawatts. Look at the, what is now happening with the investment in the, in the independent power sector, in the off-grid power sector. Young people from all over are coming in with their partners from abroad to come and put independent, independent power plants. This is what the president has done to energize the, the the business spirits of the Zimbabweans, and they are coming to the fore in many, many more ways than one. So this is the, this is, this is the, the, the positive, bullish message 
which were communicated to you that it has been a good year for our president, it has been a good year for our party, and it has been a good year for the government of Zimbabwe. And for the youth, this is very important. We have an educated population. Most of them, because of the two decades of urban decay, but also because of what happened before our party was rejuvenated by President in 2017. There was no hope. All these things I'm talking about, they mean new jobs for young people. I'll give you an example of the excitement. Which, do you know that we had an electric railway line in Zimbabwe between Dabuka and Harare, and it was abandoned? The young people, the engineers who built that railway line, they left the country. You know where they were? They are. They went and started working for British Rail. 30, 40 years later, they are experienced, they are retiring. They are Zimbabwe. They now know that there will be a new railway line to be built from Selu to the Saidi to take ferrochrome away from the road. They now know that there will be a new railway line built from Lions Den to Lusaka to take Zambia and cobalt and copper off the road. Have you ever traveled on this road going to Turundi? It's almost like it's a, it's a train of 30 ton trucks. They are carrying cobalt and copper from Zambia to, to Bayer. If you ever traveled on the road from Victoria Falls to Blawayo and you hit Wange, the road is gone. We are taking coking coal from Wange to South Africa, Acelo Metal, delivering 300, 400,000 tons of coking coal by road. Do you realize that we'll need a railway line between Manise and Vuma? Do you realize we'll need a railway line between Vuma and Nyazura to carry steel? Do you realize we'll need a railway line from Mashingo to Rutenga to deliver steel to South Africa and to, to, to Maputo? These are the things which make the two leaders meet more often. You understand? And that young, those young engineers now seasoned they are now looking at coming back home with the experience which they get over the years to come and give Zimbabwe a logistical network to support all this regional traffic, all this internal traffic. And people don't see hope in that. I'm saying to young people, don't be misled. What's happening in this economy will have a big impact on who you are and put your mind in the proper frame of thinking. Because you, we hit by lightning, and then he says, "Abane kupi, am nangagua waruita mashura." This is which our economy is, and we need our young people to be properly psyched to understand where we are going. These will be top-notch jobs, which will cater for our diaspora, which will cater for our educated young people at home, which will also cater. And the, 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 have you re, seen the return of the white diaspora into the country? And I go my titled, which title did they exist? The white diaspora is coming back from the 70s and from the 80s. All of them, they are destroying the one house which the family left in the 1970s and 80s. They are building six to seven detached houses, six for rent, one for the family. This is our white, if we go to Northern to borrow the, I mean, to borrow the, I mean, to, uh, to, to borrow there on Saturday, on Sunday, Saturday. You would think you are in North London, because our white population is identifying once again with home. And this is happening with our diaspora, the black diaspora from the 2000s. Look at Madokero, look at what all of, and the Ndagume Misha, young people who are digging gold, who supply 2.63% of the 2.4 billion US dollars of gold, you know, 2.4 billion dollars worth of gold we produce. They are building solar, solar panels all over in, in, in rural areas. They are supporting their families as just much as they are supporting the central bank to have the currency which we have. So this is the new Zimbabwe. That's why the country is on a trajectory which is good. And that's what we want to say to, to you. Keep your eyes open to you. Inform the population accordingly that Zimbabwe, the, the, the Zimbabwe is on, 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 on a winning streak.
A, because nothing succeeds like success. And that summarizes what President Minangagwa has been doing for this economy. I think, by and large, I have said what I wanted to say, to say this is the end of the year. It has been a good year for ZAN PF. It has been a good year for the government of Zimbabwe. It has been a good year for the people of Zimbabwe. And most important, President Mnangagwa is delivering success and is on the verge of delivering even more successes to this economy because mainly he is harnessing the creative and enterprising pursuits of the Zimbabweans as they work day to day in agriculture, in mining, you know, in, in all us, in tourism. Zimbabweans have this new feeling that we can do it. He has created a can-do feeling among Zimbabweans. We are no longer a country which everybody thought was a hopeless case. Even the IMF was here. They are now talking a different language. They want to give the Zimbabwe the support, even when their shareholders are not yet decided to lift sanctions. And by the way, their shareholders are sending feelers to say, how do we also ride on to it? So this is, this, is, this is what the president has done to this economy. A can-do spirit is, again, a court hold of Zimbabweans. And we are going to do what Africa has never, been, has never done. And the prospect of a middle-income status country is getting closer and closer, probably will be there before 2030. And we are very happy that the electorate in urban areas is beginning to cotton on to what ZANPF is doing. That's why we are delivering a by-election victories at local government level. We think that as more elections come because of the infighting within Triple C, we are going to score more victories. We are not the ones who occasion the by-elections. So those who want to peddle the notion that it's because ZANU-PF wants two-thirds majority, we don't need two-thirds majority to run the country. We don't. And we don't need to change the constitution for a third term of our president. There are people who create problems within their party. The consequences reach to parliament. Then they want to ascribe the result of their consequences to ZANU-PF. No. Chickens come home to roost. Your party is disorganized. You cause the elections. Don't try to get an explanation as to why all, all elections are happening in ZANU-PF. And because the electorate is seeing that you are disorganized, you are continuously losing by elections, even in urban areas, which were their strongholds. This should be a writing on the wall to triple C that their days are numbered. And by the way, I want to end on this note. We want an organized and and, and structured country, which means also the opposition we need is organized and structured so that parliamentary business can s proceed smoothly so that the people of Zimbabwe can have the oversight of parliament. So this is what ZANU-PF wishes, not the Wapusa Wapusa disorganization in Triple C, which makes us go to elections every other day. It distracts our mind from the business of governance and delivering prosperity to Zimbabwe. So we have absolutely nothing to gain as a party and everything to lose by the internecine fights which are in the triple C. So don't try to say we have an attitude of trying to disorganize the, the opposition for our own gain. No, these are homegrown problems which are being thrust upon ZANU-PF. We have no intentions of changing the constitution. We have no intentions about third part, a third term for this or that. We only have focus on vision 2030 and the prospect of a middle income society for Zimbabwe. And next time Mahere speaks, tell her that if you read, you must also grasp, you must also comprehend, you must also apprehend, you must also understand. Reading alone is not enough and give respect 
to the professional competence of people in their different disciplines. Just because you are a lawyer doesn't mean you become an expert on economics. Uh, just because you are a lawyer doesn't mean you are an expert on monetary finance. Just because you are a lawyer doesn't mean you are an expert on fiscal issues. And I'm not sure she's a good lawyer either because there are parties losing all these, these court cases. Maybe she would have carried that magic to convince the judges to give them favorable judgments when all the facts point to facts that their evidence is wrong. They can't adduce evidence to the judge. So maybe a yeah, woman should more to do with the legal problems of your party than delving into the fields of financial economics, which she has little knowledge of. And we are going to assure you also this is important. Starlink is a technolog technological marvel, Starlink Internet. It is a leap the same way GSM cellular was a leap from the fixed phones. Before, people used to look for phones to make a phone call. Now the phone looks for you because it's mobile, it's a mobile world. Now, people used to build fiber optics and base stations to deliver the message to the phone. But now, with what's happening now with the technology, there's what is called low Earth orbit satellites at 500 kilometers instead of 29,000 geostationary satellites. So it means that the, the technology to deliver internet is, makes it possible for any remote part of the world to have internet connectivity. This is the ultimate digital inclusion which we want. So Starlink of Elon Musk has become, become the first company to make that breakthrough commercial breakthrough. There are three or four or five others in tow which will be joining this. And there are also geopolitical considerations. Do you want to go with the European one? Do you go with the American one? Do you want to go with the Chinese one? So these are all things which we are looking at. But you can be assured that a right decision will be made to make sure that Zimbabwe joins our friends in Mozambique who are already on Starlink our neighbors in Zambia who are already on Starlink and many other because it's a leapfrog in technology and ZANU PF wants technology to help in digital and financial inclusivity of the country. So the right decisions will be made to make sure that Zimbabwe has got affordable internet. Now if you have got historical investment in a technology which may now be challenged. It's exactly the same story with the PTC and the Net One and Cell and 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 and, and you know we cannot stop the country's much of progress because there are legacy people people with these legacy investments with technology which may yet to be amortized because technology has leapfrogged. We go to the next stage. So you know some people you know they also go to my area and start talking about uh, this or that about Starlink. They are trying to protect legal, legacy technology which have been bypassed or leapfrogged by new technologies. The Zimbabwe government caters only for what are the needs of the Zimbabwe population. Delivery of services at lowest cost. That's what we want. So we find ways of making sure that we join the technology bandwagon in terms of satellite, digital satellite internet or satellite digital internet. I thank you. Do we have any questions? It's the end of the year. We have got a whole year where you want to assess what we have been doing. This is your chance. All the burning questions, I have the, I have the time. Are we done?
I'll start with the last one. I told you Mozambique has already reached Nyamapanda. I mean Machipanda <laughs> with its railway lines. Mozambique. We've already done it on the other side. So it means we are late if it has done it yesterday. So last cabinet, that was the preoccupation of the president. And the good thing, like you, I indicated earlier on, the balance sheet is there. Remember, what makes a railway line work is the load. You can't run a steel industry, which is going to generate 2.2 to 3 million tons of load in the next, starting in January, coming January. That's when Maniza starts. You can't run it on lorries. <laughs> steel is not wheat. Steel is not beef. Steel needs railways. So we are late. We are late for our wedding, <laughs> if I can put it. This is how I can put it. Zimbabwe is late for our wedding. The wedding is on, and you are the bride or the groom, and you are still on your way to your wedding. We are late. So there is an agency about the railway infrastructure, and the good thing is that regional capital in South Africa has seen the opportunity. Because our steel industry will be much more competitive than that one of South Africa. Maybe by the time you leave here, you read, maybe South Africa steel plant may close because they can't compete with those in Zimbabwe. In terms of production cost, the Maniza steel plant is seven kilometers from the mine, seven kilometers from the mine. The, co the, co the chrome is on the Great Dyke, which is 10 to 20 kilometers from the mine, but it ex extends all the way from Rwanda to Shambu. So that's where the chrome will be coming from. The coking coal is 300 kilometers straight line from Manize to Wangwe. Right now, maybe it is going through Blawayo and coming back, but later we have to go straight to Wangwe. Then the port to deliver all those things was the amount of steel which Zimbabwe is going to produce is not for local consumption. We'll be producing for world consumption. We'll be going to 5 million, 10 million tons. The ports are in Mozambique. <laughs> and Mozambique has already started building the railways and the ports for that. So I go back again. We are late for our wedding. It's money now. And because the balance sheet is created by the Lord, it means the investors are trooping. They are literally knocking on the Zimbabwe door now. Uh, and yours truly is involved in raising funds for those projects. I can't talk about the details because it's confidential business information. The same thing is happening to electricity. You cannot run steel plants without electricity. Uh, there is closure now in term sheets and disbursements for the transmission lines from Sherwood to Manize. At the same time, there was a 50 kilowatt, me, no, me, is it kilo, 50,000 megawatt plant going on at Manize, a coal one to support the steel plant. We are not talking about the solar ones, which are also being built in that area and the prospect of wind one. So it's not only logistics, it's not only railway, it's power. There has to be a dam to supply a new town of 40,000. We have to plan for a new town of 40,000 people at Manize in the next 24 months. Because all the manufacturing, because steel is a raw material. What does it do? It wants fabrication. It wants foundry to be turned into railways, to be turned into pylons, to be turned into base stations, to be turned into angle steel for construction. This is what is, this, all this, that's why the inquiries which are coming on to Zimbabwe about the steel industry, they are on a scale which we have never known. And remember, Ukraine has just closed down a 4 million ton a year steel plant. So there is a gap, even because we, we know which, which has to be filled in. So we are late for our wedding. That's how I can put it. There's an agent. That's why I'm saying the, 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 the bullish aspect of our economy is going to be to hit toxins like a bullet from the, from the heavens. The toxins which I'm talking about, the economic toxins and business toxins, they are going to be hit by a bullet from the heavens, from God, as this economy is 
gets into new gear. Yes, we are having children. You know, the president went to the coronation of Prince Charles, become the king of England. The president was back again. I think it was uh, for, for when he met Andrew Mitchell with another meeting in London. Now the, 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 they met again in Dubai. With, and uh, the, I can tell you the vibe is good. The British cannot wait for Zimbabwe to be back in the Commonwealth. And I had a good meeting with the British ambassador just over a week ago. The chemistry is good. The chemistry is very good. If right in the spirit of the president, we are enemies to none and friends to all. And the British have taken it in stride. We have a lot of historical angst, umbrages with them. But we cannot stop grasping the future because there's so much which is going on, which can go on between the two countries, simply because of the fate of entwinement of history and culture and language between the two countries. So it's a wholesome arrangement. It's a virtuous thing, and we are happy about it. You can ask even the British ambassador to confirm what I'm saying. It's mutual. It's a mutual, virtuous engagement. It's not something like one side is craving for it. And I can assure you it is creating no joy to be part of toxic and pessimist, which is called triple C. Wapusa, wapusa has been problem. Wapusa, wapusa, and ambiguous. What is called strategic ambiguity? <laughs> you see, if you are strategically ambiguous, you got to convince the enemy that you are strategically ambiguous so that you win. <laughs> the moment the strategic ambiguity begins, in, it, it, it backfires on you, boomerangs on you. <laughs> then, then you are misled because now they have been strategically ambiguous themselves. They are the victim of chickens come home to roost. <laughs> strategic ambiguity is striking right at the source in triple T. So there's total confusion there. And uh, we don't cherish it because we would rather prefer an organized and structured opposition for the progress of the country. This is genuine sentiment from ZANPF, from our president. Yeah. If they want, maybe we should go and tell. They can invite us because we are ardent party builders by nature. Maybe they can come and we learn, we learn from each other. Yeah, but the starting point is, can they just say, send, Chamisa send a word to the president that congratulations, you won the 23 August election. Those magic words yeah, would really open a lot of vistas. Congratulations, Mr. President, you won the elections, I lost. Then we can start talking from there. But the MPs have already done their amount, they haven't been, they accepted their win. So, you know, if these MPs can be accept, you also should accept. A tag team of a wife and a husband gets engaged in a contest, in, in, in a competition. The husband wins, the wife loses, or other this. Then one says she won, the other one says he lost. Ah, it doesn't work. You know you're a tag team. <laughs> if one wins, you must accept that he won. If the other one lost, you must accept that also. You, if you lost, then you must accept that. Because it was the same race, the same competition. But uh, somehow, triple C want to cherry pick their wins and their, loss, and their losses. It doesn't work. It was one race. You want to ask a question? Nda taura kuti ba muna nga gwa muna 2023. Wakaramba wakaisa wepungwa zao kuti Zimbabwe inga budiri resei. E, waka tenderera nyika eno yese. Wa chi end 
kuenda kunzimbo zaka siyana siyana zine ma projects makuru anovandutsa kuti muenyika e, lithium yedi ya Zimbabwe yakura zvisari zvamboonekwa yatove kuti zvikanwa pasi rinorese kuti ramangwana remotikari dzema battery Zimbabwe inenge yakamira ipapo pamamonya ipapo penya ya industry ya lithium tichigona kwa muna ngagwa kuti tave monya se Zimbabwe mzi new energy lithium battery a supply chain of the world. Kugona kwa mnanga kwa kudai zamari, wombe wombe ye pasirino, kutipinde mnika munu, wachu ungorora, upumu wataka pi wanamwari, uneta kutiwa noti, wawia wacho watapiri ilwe, nisu wataka pi wanamwari, zoba tani vikuwa nefungwa zewano umu Zimbabwe, kutitiburi ze zinu zinu cherwa, zinu opisu kwa umu Zimbabwe, zichita lithium carbonate, Ya we kukuza mari kupinda kubanga guru kana kuomwe nyika. Zosha yetu kwa zimwe mnila ya litia mzi muna januari. Tirikuta alisa na kutu Zimbabwe hicha wepa nyika ya inamba mpa msoro soro mwa Afrika. Panu pama nize pachitanga kuburitu kwa mvuto zesimbi. Isati ya mbuone kwa mwa Afrika. Ichi bapama nize. E, ta ingati chitenga kune zimwe nyika 6.3 billion US dollars de steel. Iye zinu kubira muna jawano waritaku ita muna mzimbabu. Pamsoro pazo tenge saku ni zimwe nyika an additional 2 billion tons. Iye heavy industry ya ndri kutawarai. Saka ine zaine ita kune njanji, ine zaine ita kune magets, ine zaine ita kune mvura, ine zaine ita kukuma kukuma town di matwa. E, tatota risana iye zinu kutitisha waka town di chakuma kukuma nize, yeva nu 40,000 special economic zone. Izo zi kumachipanda Mozambique ya tositza njanjiayo kwa 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 futi e, kugungwa. Mapotsi matwa e kuti zinu zi una zi wamu Zimbabwe. Zichenda uti Mozambique kwa nise kuzitengesa kune zimwe nyika. Mozambique yato na zirira. Kutambira zinu izo zi kutu zikotengesa kwa kune zimwe nyika. Izo zichenda uti mabasa anudiwa ni wano wamu Zimbabwe. Epa msoro soro awandi na i, imari wombe epa nyika chinu. Ipa sirinu, ishawu ya Muzibabu kuzo nazira. Zema woko zema Muzibabu, zepa msoro soro zichatengi kwa kune zimu yi. Saka zinu za kadaro zinuda kungwa za karodwa. Saka nima woko ane unyanzi, maskills. Zese ushaeda watiba na vechi diki za Muzibabu. Watarisi ni mabasa, ipa msoro soro ano tapira. Ano ita uti upenyu wawo unaki. Saka zikuti mchoriro, unita uti urambo wakarara uti zikanda pasi. Nda uchi wa amna nga kwa wako uya kuzoti. Utapirire wechidiki ni nika yaka jeka yaka tarisa na 2030 and the prospect of middle income is safest. I thank you. I can try to speak short at least. I'm not going to put the anime short. Thank you. Ah, the, the last thing is we want to emphasize it is not the duty of the central government to provide the services in urban areas. It is the duty of the local government. But now, because of the ineptitude of, this, of the local government, the central government is having to intervene. Because we cannot tolerate cholera stalking in Wanom Zimbabwe. We cannot talk, tolerate, tolerate my poor roads because they have got as much as I to enjoy Zimbabwe's prosperity as those in the rural areas where things are being run properly by Zanu PF. So there will be a lot of interventionist policy by the central government in local, in local areas. If need be, we may use the statute to intervene to make sure that the towns can cater for the investment we are talking about. We cannot have towns which cannot cater for the investment which are coming in. Makaba no we are going to come up to so we, we will have an interventionist policy in urban areas to make sure that they catch up with the mood of ZANU PF and President E.D. Mnangagwa in terms of development goals. We will not let like a deisical or indeed absent performance by the PPC town administrations, town fathers. Uh, pull Zimbabwe down. We will not allow it. I think. <laughs>